So I'm joined today after a momentous weekend and a momentous week with uh, Thomas Gallagher from Derry. And uh, for anyone up in Derry, I think uh, he doesn't need much introduction, but we do need to introduce him to the rest of Ireland and uh, and further abroad. And I just thought I'd take the time here to to talk to Thomas about uh, the Curcio movement, about the different prophecies that have been spoken about over the last number of years. And a little bit at the end, we'll touch on uh, Home of the Mother and Sister Claire Crockett. But Thomas, I just thought, thanks for joining me. And uh, if you want to kick off this discussion a little bit, introduce yourself and uh, Derry, Curcio movement and uh, the where we are with the faith in Ireland and the hope that we can give for the future. Yeah. I'll probably introduce myself. I'm, I'm normally behind the scenes. I'm not normally a person that's up front. And um, obviously we're walking for 35 years here now. And one of the, one of the main partners things is my father always to say, a, a, a little boy should be seen and not heard. Mm. <laughs> In a sense. But it's not that we operate that way. The, the Curcio too has been operating for a long time. Uh, and it's not something that's above the radar. It's something that's under there. And we've never sought publicity for, for the walk or the things that we do. But now that it's coming uh, 35 years on, obviously the Lord wants to open that up. And uh, mm. and, and through the modern technology, it's actually they speak about what we what, what the background is. But I really emphasize that point. It's not something that we're seeking to be uh, to be out there in front and actually. But it's, it's obviously there's a message here that needs to be needs to be spread, needs to be talked about, and needs to be explained. So that's the thing. And I thank you yeah. for that opportunity today. No, no problem. Um, I suppose uh, I've met a few people that have done the Curcio in, in Derry, especially last year, uh, being introduced to everything that's happening there. And could you just take people in Ireland through... Uh, the movement and and um, because it, it seems to be very vibrant and very much lay led like what's what's the, the 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 underpinning of 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 this movement and and how can people get involved yeah it's a it's a long time involved in, in ireland as such but not in the north and the north is more recent in a sense of 40 years uh since mm. 1978 um mm. in the north so and actually the Curcio begins in the 1930s mm. uh, and in Spain, uh, the Spain of the, uh, just before the Spanish Civil War. And, uh, and it's, it grows out of uh, a Catholic action, which again, I think is around the turn of the century, Pope Pius the 10th or in the 9th or 10th or whatever, actually had uh, began Catholic action. And it was a very strong movement in Spain. And uh, in the 1930s, prior, before the beginning of the Spanish Civil War, they had launched a plan to take 100,000 young people to walk to Compostela. Mm -hmm. And in preparation, and in preparation for that huge, uh, huge uh, walk from all over Spain, uh, they had set up small committees, uh, Catholic action committees, to attract young people and to prepare them. Uh, so the, really the, the, the way of preparation was that they were going to give courses uh, on the faith uh, to develop the young people before they set off on the walk. Uh, to, to that, a uh, course in Spanish is Curcio. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, so the kind of, the, the, that's, that's what, so Eduardo, Eduardo Bonin, the founder of, of the Curcio's, Curcio de Christian Dad, is the Curcio that we follow today. It's a, it's a spin-off from Catholic Action. Uh, it's a development. So to explain that, uh, Catholic Action was a, an organization for the faithful Catholic to develop their catechism, to develop their understanding of the magisterium of the faith in a very, very deep way. But it sought those who were growing in the faith, already baptized, already in the faith. So it, when Eduardo came along, and especially before the war, when he was... Uh, conscripted under the Spanish army, he started to notice what was going on in there. So he was a, he was a person who grew up in a very, very strong faith, well-educated, well-catechized, well-prepared, uh, intellectually uh, very, very bright. And, and somebody had read, had read all the theologians of that era and, and really understood that. 
So he was conscri conscripted into the Spanish army, he was based in, uh, in Majorca, but he had flat feet. So he wasn't, yeah. he wasn't suitable for to be out in the, in the field fighting, but he was suitable, suitable for working in the office system. That. So there he observed people. And he observed the soldiers who, who, who would be coming into the big city and uh, then were getting affected by the nightlife and going to brothels and going, some of them were married, some of them were single. And he observed how they changed and how they, he noticed how they behaved and, and how their behavior changed. And, and, uh, and those, those soldiers he would, he would listen to and he would, he would question, you know, about why, why they did that. And, you know, how, how was their family background? And uh, certainly how would they feel if, uh, if anybody in the family would find out? So he, he realized that actually uh, that they were a microcosm of what was happening in Spain between uh, for that period of time uh, with the Spanish Civil War, with the, the Second World War coming in. And he observed that actually in Spain, many men were drifting away from the church. Communism was rife. Socialism was rife. Every other excuse, and it was dragging people away, away from the uh, from the faith. So he really, uh, with this group of friends, they were often discussing it, and they thought, you know, Catholic action is is preaching to the converted. How do we reach those that are kind of falling away from faith? How do we bring them back to the faith? And that was the big thing that they nurtured that idea, and that's that's basically the basis of the charism uh, of of, of Crusoe. To reach out to the far away. What he noticed most was that actually they had lost, the men had lost the sense how much God loves them. They lost the, the sense of having contact with God. They lost the sense of because of their, their sinfulness, because of the things that were distracting them, that they'd lost the sense of actually praying and asking God on their lives to, uh, to work on their lives. So they were contemplating how do we, how do we, how do we break on that? So this, uh, <clears throat> With the beginning of the Spanish Civil War, it delayed it delayed the walk to Compostela. So over those years, with still preparing the groups, hoping when the war when the war would end, uh, when the Spanish Civil War would end, that they would have the the Camino uh, to Cop, uh, to Compostela. So in that period of time, they nurtured this uh, this idea. They know they were being led by the Holy Spirit. Uh, so anyway, they, he uh, he had developed and anyway, he wrote a. Uh, he wrote a, a talk for, for the Crusios, uh, which was called The Study of the Environment. Um, and, and, and that he was uh, he, he tried to encompass how he contemplated, how he began to notice, how he was looking at the environment and seeing and trying to work out methods of how he could attract people back under the faith. Uh, when he started to deliver that, really was that was the building block, that was the change between Catholic action and the Crusoe of Christian Dad today, right? So the next stage of that was, uh, you know, he had difficulties. He was seen to be radical. He was seen to be, uh, uh, you know, not in the faith in many ways and, uh, and because of his thinking. But then uh, there was an article from, uh, I think it may have been Pope Pius XII, where he spoke to all the, the, the parish priests in the world. And obviously, because of the war, because of, of, of the Pope becoming identified with that mentality that actually many people were, were, were losing faith and moving away. So the Pope wrote an article to, to the parish priests of the world, or uh, I don't know if it's specific to Italy or whatever, but anyway, uh, when, when Eduardo uh, read the article, he realized this was the commission. This was the, the Holy Spirit guide. And the article basically from the Pope directed the parish priest to say, don't just look at the people who are attending mass. Just don't support the people. Really look out on your society and the fringes of your society and your parish and start to look and see what's happening with people uh, and why they're not coming there and try to find methods and different ways to attract them back to the truth. Uh, and that was like the key key commission of, of, of Eduardo then. So the first weekend, I think it was, uh, the first recognized weekend is 1949, but actually the experimental weekend of 1943 was really the beginning of it. Uh, and from that point, they needed to one support for, for, uh, for the Crusoe. So they tried, were working on the church and it was extremely difficult. But then what happened, uh, it's a very special event in the Crusoe. What happened then was uh, the local bishop in, uh, in, in Palma, 
uh, was a special Juan Herres. And uh, there was an event where there was uh, some brutal murders and the two two suspects had been uh, had been uh, had been sentenced to death. And the normal course of events, the the priest would go and uh, and actually uh, hear their last confession and so on and so forth. But in this case, actually, uh, they completely rejected the church, and they rejected it up up to the the final day. And on the final day, uh, the bishop thought he had always heard Eduardo in it. And uh, his friend actually were always coming to talk to him about Priscilla and, and try to get him sold on the idea of, of how important the Priscilla was. So what happens was the bishop made contact with, with Eduardo and his friend and, and basically said, look, will you go on our behalf and see what you can do? Because we, we have been completely rejected in this case. So they went to the, the prison that night and they, and they spoke uh, deeply with the men. And so the men initially were were rejecting any uh, any any contact, and they were being they were hiding their emotion, their fear, and and everything. So they stayed they stayed all night. But what they had done in preparation is they got a whole community of people who who were involved in Catholic action and Crusoe. They pray for those men while they were there, and and during the night they started to break down and started to to open up, and they told them that uh, they were very lucky men because. There's very few people, if anybody in the world knows the time of their death. Mm -hmm. But their time of their death was set. And they were saying, because of the love of Christ, as in the, the love of Christ for the repentant uh, soul on, uh, on the cross itself, that they were they could be guaranteed heaven tomorrow morning. Uh, so eventually that started to break open. So eventually the man completely opened up. Uh, I had a long discussion with the warder, repented of everything they were doing. And in the early morning, they both received confession. Mm. Eduardo uh, and the Crusoe in the method, actually, when anybody goes to speak, there's a, there's a cross called the Speaker's Cross, a small cross that people would hold in their hand while they present uh, a talk in Crusoe. And uh, Eduardo had that cross in his, his, his hand the whole time. One of the men noticed the cross, and he, and he asked, uh, um, could he have the cross? So he went to, he went, uh, he had had after confession and after breakfast, they, they went out to their death. And uh, the first man went to his death and he had uh, Eduardo's cross and he kissed the cross before, before the guillotine fell upon him. Oh, wow. And the second, the second, uh, the second, uh, the second man did exactly the same. So that is that. Uh, that was the car. That was the moment that kind of just exploded the crusade. Because from that point on, uh, Juan Bishop Hervis is renowned uh, for being uh, kind of one of the main one of the main uh, graces uh, uh, in the beginning of the whole crusade. From that point, it exploded and spread across the world. So, mm -hmm. so it comes to uh, it comes to South America first. Uh, it goes to North America, Texas. After that, it spreads across uh, America. And then in 19, uh, there was a bishop in Kilkenny at the time, I can't remember his, his name, he was very progressive, and he was the first to invite the Crusoes to, to Ireland, and it was established in Kilkenny, then it was established in Roscommon. Uh, the North, that begins in 1978, and it's, it's an Irish priest who was in Chicago, and, and he had experienced the Crusoe in Chicago. Uh, and he said to the people in Chicago at the end of that of his experience with Crusoe, this is something that is needed in Northern Ireland. This is something that's needed in the heart of the troubles. So uh, I don't know if he was Servite, but anyway, he linked up with the Servites in Red Burb. And, uh, and the American team uh, decided, right, OK, and they, they planned for a year later and they brought all their families, I think 40 families, all came from Chicago over to Ireland. They put on the first weekend in Red Burb in 1978. It, uh, it, uh, Father John B. Duffy would be central to that. He was based in Van Burb at the time, a servite, and he was doing a retreat in 19, 1976 and 70, 1977, uh, 1976, 77 in Derry. And it was in the parish of Karen Hill, and it was flooded with people, people from all over the city. He was known as the singing priest, but a really strong character. And uh, John B. Duffy, anyway, when he, when he heard about the Crusoes the, the following year, 
he uh, he came back to there and he, he picked 12 apostles. He picked 12 men that attended those crusades that he got to know and brought them, brought them to remember as part of, and, that, and it's from that point that the crusade for us. It dies though, it dies because the charism is to reach out to the far away. That means that everybody is acceptable at Crusoe. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter where their where their position lay. But initially, it was taken as a kind of elitism. It was like it, it, it was taken for the privileged, and they were they were seeking that more like the Catholic action. Those who are already of faith, and and there was a lot of structure to it, and it dies off. Uh, so what happens, I'm basically that it, it, it died to the point that uh, it was it was it was disappearing, and then in 1985 the American team came back, and this time they came back to Derry and to, and the whole thing was off, and from that point it went like wildfire through the north. Um, it's important to realize that actually the Crusio actually centered itself, and you see this is this is the spirit and this is God's good God's idea. In the north, at that point in time, while the while Northern Ireland all seemed to be in the middle of a war, mm -hmm. it really that war was more centered on the Republican areas of Derry and, and the Derry and the bog side of the Craigan uh, and and West Belfast and and South Armagh. And uh, when the crusade comes, it goes into those areas, mm -hmm. and there's mass conversions. You know, there's mass conversions away from violence. So. It was a it was a mechanism for changing hearts and minds. Mm -hmm. uh, so later, so that's from 1985 on. I mean, like wildfire, to the point today. And and the Derry diocese alone, like there's 220,000 Catholics as such. Uh, but over 10,000 of those, uh, uh, this stage up to up towards around that mark, around 10,000. But if you take on the youth programs of Poor and Church as well, it's actually it's bigger again. So you're really looking at a lot of evangelization. You no, know, you used to really think about 10,000 homes, mm -hmm. the impact of one person in a home finding Christ and that sort of stuff and how the ripple effect of that goes out in the society itself. So that's really kind of the, the, the background of the Christian. It's a charism for the far away. The simplicity is, is built, the simplicity of Christian uh, is built on the three cardinal virtues, faith, hope, and charity, faith, hope, and love. What we have in our society today is actually no hope. People have lost hope. They've lost their way because they have no hope in God. They can't see the future. They see the darkness, but they don't see the light. Yeah. And that's what Christian is. It brings light into the darkness. And it's for anybody. It's not elite. It's for because every soul is important to God. And that's, you know, sometimes I was like, when we talk in joy, you know, we, we are, we understand the church, we understand the faith, we understand the magnetarium, and we live in the faith. We don't, we don't live outside of it, you know, mm -hmm. but you've got to give people the time to grow. When you bring people back to faith, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it, yeah. It's, it's yeah. the process of time. And really, it's by their own choice. So really, what you would have in a crusade weekend is, is, a, is, a, is a space where the three cardinal virtues are real. You come on the on, on men and women's weekends on Crusoe, you come into a community that show the love. They don't show the love that they have for for things or for the world or for the, they show the love that they have for God, right? Um, they have faith. And God builds his builds his church on on a mustard seed of faith. Yeah. Right. So we show we show faith. So it's an environment of faith and an environment of love, and in that environment of, of faith and love, we share our testimonies, we share our life, we share the basics of what it is to be a Christian in the world today. Because a lot of people have to start off for the very basic. The crusade is always about the basics, and from there comes hope, because people look at us and see the hope that we have, and they want it, and that's it, and it's ongoing. And every generation and every, like, you know, it's, 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 it's a time, it's a time in Ireland where we know there's 70% of the people don't even believe in the Eucharist. 70% of Catholics, if they, if they believe at all, they, they, they don't believe in the Eucharist. That's all we try to live. We are living the faith. Mm -hmm. 
and and that's it and 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 it's um you know it developed from there it's not about it's not about going out trying to take prisoners uh often when i was speaking of course you don't take prisoners they haven't jesus doesn't take prisoners when he loved the whole when he walked among people on earth and that sort of stuff he didn't take prisoners to him he respected people where they're at he looked them in the eyes you know that whole thing about emmanuel god coming down from heaven and stand in front of us and actually he, he, he doesn't look down at us he doesn't look up at us he looks us straight in the eyes what do you want me to do for you yeah and that to me is uh, is the simplicity of what it is to be a christian that's the simplicity of the work that not we go out and we give witness yeah and we look people straight in the eyes and tell them do you know how much god loves you yeah you know yeah. god loves you uh, <laughs> you you probably don't even know that and that's a simple message of the christ too God loves, and we demonstrate that love uh, in a real way. Uh, and uh, whatever God directs us to do, we'll do. You know? Yeah. So Jesus is alive in the world, just like He was alive. You know, I I think often we get caught up in this whole semantics about the church and about we are the church. The big message of the Christian: we are the church. The church is not necessarily the hierarchy. They're part of the church. They're there. They've got a ministry to give to us, but we are the church. You know. And this thing about actually taking prisoners or having to do it this way or having to do it that way, Jesus, I mean, look at him, look at the example that he set on earth, tax collectors and things like that. That's the crucial. Yeah. Yeah. I but, mean, I, I, I was so impressed uh, when I went to um, Loch Dirk and I didn't actually know anything about the crucial, uh, but three, um, three to four years ago, I was on Loch Dirk, which a pilgrimage that the Curcio had organized with Bishop Donal and uh, you had actually walked to Loch Derg and I was I was impressed at the time not knowing you and uh, even more impressed last year but I'm, I'm impressed exactly what you said you know we need to go to those who know hope and say to them look you can live your life differently and that's what, I, what so impressed me with with, with everything that uh, I see happening in Derry. And the, and, the, and the key message I would say to anybody in Ireland is don't don't look don't look at the areas where you disagree. Just look yeah. at Jesus. Yeah. If you know the if you get to know the Jesus, I know, you know, God with us. You know, and that's the key to the walk because 35 years and the walk becomes individual for the people. They develop under the walk. And it's not my walk, it's their walk. They, they everybody owns it. Because Jesus is there, he's the glue, he's there, and, and the Holy Spirit is there within, within it. And I say, and I feel like a lot of times when I'm on the walk, I'm not, I saw from Walk of Three, is it? Yeah. I'm going from Capernaum to Galilee, or go, going from Nazareth to Jerusalem, or whatever. You know, the whole, if you really get the, get the stories, it's a loving thing, Jesus actually walking. A lovely, a lovely reflection that I would have is actually for people, let's think about it this way. Who were the people that saw him first? Who were the people of summer? The shepherds on the hillside. The nobodies. The, 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 the men that were oblivious to the whole society because they worked at night guarding the sheep, slept during the day, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's amazing. You know, and, and they're 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 the men, they're the men that walked to that cave that night when they saw the angels coming down and they were done and they give the simple stuff that Mary and Joseph needed. Bread and cheese and milk and and the things they got the wool for the the manger. The comfortable right. They are also the men. Now I'll, I'll tell a bit of this story because it's very important. They are also the men that when Herod's men came, they they worked that area. They were on the hillsides around that. That was their life and that was their area of work. And suddenly, when all the innocents are 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 killed. And they're still clinging to that hope. They're, 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 they couldn't deny what they have witnessed. So they end up being scattered all over Israel. And in the darkness of that period of actually when, when Jesus is born to the point where he begins his ministry and, and he's revealed, I, these men are talking about the stories of, of the Holy Night. And, and their stories, and, and working for probably despot Pharisees and, and, and being ill-treated, but yet and all, they're in small communities of people that actually, it's all broken up all around Israel. 
And they're talking about the Jesus that they know. Yeah. They're talking about what they witnessed. There. So often when we see actually the story of Jesus and the disciples, a lot of the disciples were the people who were prepared by the shepherds. Yeah. And they were the communication uh, base for actually for Jesus. Jesus would say to the shepherds, I'm going to Galilee. I'll be there in three days' time. And they would carry the message for him. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Right? Me. And this is the real reality. Like, uh, they'd be unseen and hidden, but carrying the light. Yeah. That's what we all have to be. We have to become humble shepherds. Yeah. Like, and what's a humble shepherd? The epitome of a humble shepherd is Jesus himself. Instead of getting caught up in this whole semantics about what's going on in our church and the matters, we're, we're, all, we're all aware of it. And who's got it right and who's got it wrong and who's going right there. If you just become the humble shepherd and love it, you've got everything. Yeah. Because you've got Jesus himself. You've got the real Jesus. Does he change the substance when it becomes in the Eucharist? No. Jesus in the Eucharist and Jesus on, on, on earth is exactly the same thing. It's the same page. And he comes to reveal the Father. I know, and this is this is the beauty of the walk because that's what the walk reveals. And that's when people step out the walk. It, it's, a, it's the walking and the talking. The same way that he educated the apostles, it's the same way he'll educate us. Mm -hmm. So as we walk and talk and we share the rosary, and what's the rosary? Or that he says, it's the poor man's Bible. And an era when, when nobody could read, when nobody could write, she comes to St. Dominic and she gives the rosary. And the rosary, you see, the rosary is just not the rosary. The rosary is, is the immaculate conception. As uh, Maximilian Colby says, it's actually when he pondered how our lady could call herself the immaculate conception was impossible. And as a theologian, he was he was he was always wondering. And two weeks before he goes on the Auschwitz and then later dies, he actually came up with this, the thesis of what the, that great theology of that actually saying that Mary and, and the Annunciation is the daughter of the Father, she's the mother of the Son, and she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. And a spouse, and, and, and in terms of marriage and that sort of stuff, when a person is married, they take on the husband's name. Mm -hmm. So his theology is that actually the actual immaculate conception, the uncreated immaculate conception is the Holy Spirit, the love for the Father, for the Son, and the Son for the Father. And then the created immaculate conception is the spouse of the Holy Spirit, which is our lady. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's the that that's the key. So when we and 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 Louis de Marfer says if you truly want to understand our lady, then you have to realize that the doors of the tabernacle of our lady is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the revelation of her will only come through. Come yeah. through come to you when when the Holy Spirit opens those doors. So on the what do not come we and that humble way of that rosary, which every mystery is a mystery to be pondered, and it is unlimited depth. I always think about being a small fish in the ocean when I'm actually pondering the rosary in a sense. How deep, how wide. Mm -hmm. you, you never get to the expanse of the ocean, you know. And every single mystery <coughs> of the rosary, and because it is the Bible, it's the living word of Jesus being shared. And once you get that action of the Holy Spirit coming under that environment, and here's the point. The point is, it's not a normal public of work in that because it's every second of every day for that whole week, for that whole six days or five days or six days, given to God. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the prayer note. It's every step. I would often say, oh, sacred heart of Jesus, I place all my trust in you. And then the second thing I'll always say in the walk, and Sacred Heart of Jesus, I take every step for you because every step is a prayer. Because every step is claiming Ireland. Mm -hmm. Everybody, every step is blessing this country. Right? Because why? Because Jesus, the Holy Spirit, heaven are with us. And 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 you know, I, I, I would get emotional about it, but the point about it is that actually don't don't procrastinate about it. <laughs> Do it. And you'll discover what we've, what we've discovered. You'll discover the the real and, and, and the other thing is about the and, and Christine, there's a lot of prayers goes on and well in preparation for, for people coming to do Christian weekends. 
So we're never in a situation that we're just praying for people on the weekend. We're we're preparing we're we're preparing people we're preparing in prayer all the time for those weekends. We start six weeks before. But if you actually think of the walk, the walk is one massive grace, one massive and, and Crusoe is called Palanca. And Palanca in Spanish means a lever. Mm. And prayer is the lever of all change. So we're not sending prayer. We're, you know, another thing I would often talk to the groups, come to the walk with no expectations. Because if you come with any word like expectation, they look after your blisters or they, they get a bed at night or they be fed and that sort of stuff, then you're setting yourself up for a fall. Yeah. You know? And the other thing I would say is actually, if you, if you start talking in the morning, as you're setting off, you'll talk all day. But if you start off in prayer, you'll pray all day. Because everything becomes a prayer. The discussion and everything that we're doing and the making of the food and the preparation and the guys and the vans and the roads and everything that's happening, it's all prayer. It's not it's not uh, everybody's part of the team. Everybody's everybody's been light uh yeah. for each other in the world. So I, that's, well, <laughs> yeah. I I, I... I, and I think we go on. There's lots of stories, and and uh, I pushed uh, an, an interview there of um, with Bob Shepherd and with um, Charlie. Uh, let me get a second name. Charlie Harkin. Harkin. So, uh, and we'll be linking more in there. But uh, I, I do want to touch on on two prophecies that uh, many people m- may not be aware of regarding the walk to knock. And I just thought, could you just just detail them out a little bit for 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 listeners around Ireland, so we can just connect all of this together and and what we're going through in Ireland at this time. Um, uh, prophecies. There's there's a lot of prophecies in Ireland. There's a lot of you go back to St Patrick, and you can talk about uh, St Patrick coming in there. Now Patrick is a Patrick of the North, more likely kidnapped by nine of the nine hostages, uh, brought under slavery in Ireland. You know. We often don't think it's actually God that allowed him to be brought into slavery. Yeah. God brought him into slavery because in, in the slavery and the harshness like this, John the Baptist in the wilderness of Ireland, out on the hill of Slamish, sheep, that's that's the that's the Patrick we know, not the soft Patrick, not this plastic Patrick that we often talk about now. The Patrick that's formed in the wilderness, the, the Patrick that's that's a, a that's a tough man. You know, and that's not thing about the walk to Knock. When you actually go with the, the guys from Belfast, and I love the guys from Belfast because they're 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 real men. It's about it's about every step, and it's about and it's about sticking. It. And it doesn't matter about the pain. It's about keeping going. You know, uh, I did the Belfast walk in two thousand and two, and they could you you could learn lessons from those guys. They're really so. It's about hard men. You know, it's tough men and tough women. Mm-hmm. That, that, that's that out there. So this is this is in the mold. What I'm saying is this is in the mold of the saints of the past. Mm. So Patrick's molded. He learns the culture. He learns the language. He learns he learns everything that he needs to that he needs. Uh, and when that's established in Patrick, the angel comes again and says, "Right now, we're going to get you out of here and off to France and becomes a priest." And then here's the call to come back to Ireland. And the Ireland that he comes under at that point in is literally the end of the world. Patrick comes here not out of any. He comes here because it's the teaching of Jesus. Take the faith to the ends of the world. And that's that's the going. So anyway, the same Patrick on his mission, actually when he comes back into the north, he understands the, the language, he understands the politics, he understands the culture. So when he goes and lights that bonfire in Slamish, he knows what he's doing. And he knows he's challenging the king. And in that, in that challenge, there you have the situation where it's a head-to-head between God and Satan. Paganism versus Catholicism. And that situation. And, and, and like Moses, like Moses, Patrick is a strong man. That's for prepared. And that, so that conversion of the kings ends up converting half the country, right? So if we're going to do that, we have to have that strength. Yes. We have to be real men. We have to walk on the mold of Patrick, right? So Patrick actually, as he's alive, actually writing, writing in his confession, that he saw a time in the future with the 
darkness will descend on Ireland again. And on that, on that vision, he sees a small light burning brightly in the north. And that the flames will be ignited again. And that's really what we have to look about. This is prophecy, God's prophecy. So uh, a great friend of mine, Dennis Kerr, who, who was primarily involved in, in the first walk anyway, he was a, like a, for me, I was innocent. I didn't really understand much about the walk. Or, or why I was doing it or, or anything. But Dennis would always say to me, it's always prophecy you have to look to because if God's God will always tell us what he's going to do before he does it. Mm -hmm. He will always let his people know uh, what he's going to do before he actually does it. So when it actually came to the walk, it was my idea to start the walk, but before that there was prophecy. So Dennis said to me, Thomas, you need to be extremely careful. It's It's, it's not... This is a gift. It's a gift to you, but it's already prophesied. So that was explained then by uh, the first. The first prophecy comes in 1986. Uh, two people in Majagori uh, sitting on a bus, ready to come home. They're, they're, they're ready to take off for Split Airport, and they both witness uh, something happening in the sky, and it's a map of Ireland. So the the lady in and and the second seat from the back turns to the man in the back seat and says, can you see what I see? Now, he was already seeing it, so he had witnessed something before she did. So she, she had, uh, so anyway, he believed there to be a prophecy of doom and decided that he would never actually tell tell about it because Ireland of the Troubles, the natural, he thought it was a prophecy that Ireland was going to descend further into the civil war and the whole country was going to be destroyed. Uh, so it, it, that that was the first the first but at, um, I met him on the crochet weekend of crochet weekend that when I come out of a crisis and my my own life was led to the crochet and uh, James his name's James McFall James was at the same table as me my conversion actually came by watching a video tip of of Majigoria, uh, a mm -hmm. few months before doing the crochet weekend hearing the call to conversion but not having a all this clue how to convert. Because we can't do it on our own. But because I had made an agreement with my brother that I would do the crochet, because he was the person that got me the video, I couldn't get it. So I went to him and asked him. Uh, so he did a deal. He said, if I could do the video tape of Magigori, you'll do the crochet weekend. So in getting the video, I hear the clear call to conversion, but I don't have a, a baldish clue how to convert or how to go about it or what to do. So I arrive on the crochet weekend. And on the crochet weekend, I'm at a table with a man who's been to Magigoria in the very early years. And I'm saying, tell me all about Magigoria. And he says, no, if you want to know about Magigoria, go there. Uh, and and we become very, very close friends and, and, and the door never opens on that. So when we get to the point of the first walk, a few days before, it was the last meeting, and uh, there had been a banner prepared for the walk, which was a map of Ireland cut out in hardboard on a pole that we're going to carry all the way to, to the shrine. And uh, the, the guy that uh, had painted it uh, was named well, Hunter Freel, arrived at my door when this meeting was going on. And he knocks on the door and he says to me, have you got an image of Our Lady of Knock? I'm so honest and I don't even know what Our Lady of Knock looks like. I'm taking this walk to Knock and I have a baldish clue about Knock or about, about anything to do with it. So anyway, I said, no, look, I, I wouldn't know what this even looks like, you know. I said, but have you got the banner there? And he says, ah, and he brings it into the room. So when, what what it, what transpired then, and if we, that actually, when it, when James actually saw the banner, he reacted. I could see him go back on the seat, and I see the color of his face changed. And, uh, and uh, anyway, so the banner, let me explain the banner first. The banner was a harbor uh, map of Ireland, like a road map size on a pole and, uh, and he had painted uh, the Holy Spirit at the top reading raised down over Ireland. He, he, he painted a dairy and a flame of fire. And then he did small flames of fire because we knew the route to knock. So mm -hmm. Bala Bali Shannon, right. And, and then, but what he had also done that wasn't kind of, that just came out of the blue, it was his own. He actually painted on Belfast in a flame of fire, Dublin on a flame of fire and Cork on a flame of fire with no route. So that was, 
so it's a, it's that what really caught James's attention. And uh, so what what, uh, what transpired there anyway, we hadn't got a an image of Our Lady of Knox. So what did he do? He cut out an image of Our Lady of Mountjoy, and sellotaped it in the centre as an example of what he wanted to do with Our Lady of Knox. Uh, and that kind of that set the scene. Uh, that set the scene. So after the meeting, uh, James said to me, "I have something to share with you about Major Gore. And I said, "Okay." And he said, "Hmm, but I'm not going to share it." <laughs> and he says, "This girl Bernadette, uh, or Bernie, that was actually in, uh, in front of him, that I turned around." <coughs> he says, "What I'll do is says, I'll make arrangements. And we'll go down and talk to her tomorrow night." So we went to her house, and and over a cup of tea, she explained what she had witnessed about the whole Ireland person and the and the flame of fire. But he never, he never, he never elaborated on that. He still stayed quiet on it. Uh, so I have it, I have it on my mind. I don't know day Belfast, Dublin, Cork, but I didn't have any more than that from the banner. You know, by and, and over the over the years, we would we were grouping every week. We were great friends uh, right up until his death uh, just last uh, in the autumn of last year, and uh, and he never broke. He never broke on the whole subject. And this is many times I tried to engineer. I got to the stage and said, was it real? Was it real? You know. So anyway, uh, the just to finish his story, what happened then was that actually in 2015, the walk started from Cork. So you have Derry 1988, which is very important actually for a lot of people to realize is the Marian year. Mm -hmm. Called by Pope John Paul. You've had an awful lot of things happening across the world in that morning year. So this is a call for our lady. It's, it's a specific call because of the call of Pope John Paul the morning year. Uh, so it was 1988. Uh, Belfast uh, people were starting to come to Derry for Crusade weekends from 1990, 91, uh, 92, and then in 93 they began the walk from Belfast. Uh, obviously, in the in the middle of July in the north. <laughs> It's a very dangerous place to walk from Belfast to Nach through all the uh, <laughs> all the uh, loyalist towns and that sort of stuff. So they started they started on Armagh. Even even that, even in Armagh was about they were still going through some villages. So they actually pushed it on. That's why they started Middletown. But actually Middletown and is is roughly the same distance to Nach as it is from there. Okay. Uh, so that's uh, from ninety three they began the walk uh, with their own group. And then in 2000 and, and 2003, the walk began from Dublin. After I had been on the, the Belfast walk in 2002, and uh, and that's where the real, and it was a Derry Belfast uh, group that really kind of pulled the Dublin walk together from 2003. And, and, and Dublin is the toughest place in Ireland. Yeah. So that, let's get something right. There's actually, Although this is beginning in the north, it's a doddle from Derry and Belfast. But organising the walk from Dublin is a whole different kettle of fish. Mm. And, uh, and that's why I've been heavily involved with Dublin ever since, because it's the seat of Satan in Ireland. Yeah. And we have to be realistic here. So it's the reason. So a lot of the a lot of the changes in the south. So anyway, rolling that forward, it was only in 2015 that we got the Cork walk. Yeah. I uh, started and it's not been it's been hit and miss it's been hit and miss so it's not really properly established uh, 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 as yet so that's the first prophecy and the whole way it develops so in 2016 I go down to James now this is a man this, you've got to understand this man is suffering this man is living in 2016 at that stage almost 10 years on half a lung this man had never broken <laughs> <laughs> he's never he's never indicated any that he's going to open the door on on what he witnessed on and and Magigori. and I'm suddenly saying and I, I'm saying he's you know he could go at any minute like I'm, I'm never going to have this confirmed. So anyway, uh, in 2016, I go down to the house and uh, and I walk into the house. It's, a, it's it's probably a year after the first Cork walk, and he says, "I hear that the walk has started from Cork, Thomas." And I says, "Yeah." And he says, well, let me tell you the story now. <laughs> <laughs> I, literally, I, could, I could nearly strangle him at the same time. And, uh, and he says, uh, he says, look, he says, 
I realized this is that I told you that I wouldn't I wouldn't share anything I, and to go to Magic Orion and that sort of stuff. He says, but then we came very close friends. And he said, if I if I had a share with you what what I actually saw, I knew I was putting it in your mind that this is the way it has to happen. And he said, that's why I never spoke. And uh, and he went on to explain in detail and then I actually what I had witnessed actually sitting on the back of the bus was forward lightning strikes. Derry, knock. Belfast, knock. Dublin, knock. And Cork, knock. And then the flame of fire is beginning. So there's something about time here. You know, it's about it's about the, the real the, when the fire begins, as later did. So a lot of the a lot of the a lot of the prophecy comes uh, from, from that. It's actually it's time. God reveals in time, not you don't have. And in other words, I'm saying you, I didn't have. I have an awful lot of understanding now about knock and about history and about the whole context and everything, but I didn't have that. It's developed over time. Mm-hmm. We walk and we pray and we and things are revealed in God's time, not our time. Mm. We don't need to know. We don't need to understand. We just need to do what God has asked to do. Like, like the guys that followed the jars at the wedding feast of Cana, they just followed instructions. They, <laughs> they, didn't, they, didn't, they, they had nothing to do with that substance changing. They just put water on and wine came out. And they couldn't explain anything, about it. and neither did they have to explain because it speaks for itself. Yeah, right. And that's so everything here is, is about trust. So the second prophecy is equally as as, as important. So Dennis Dennis Kerr is he was a, a great stalwart and Christian. When you're talking about a really solid Catholic man, you know, who steeped in the faith and he didn't even curse. He didn't even say, you never hear, he never, uh, in my presence, he never cursed. When he would actually, when he would actually want to get a point across, he would say, cotton picking. <laughs> that was Dennis, I let you know, like this, I'm not going to swear here, but this is cotton, for, for, in other words, for God's sake, cotton picking, you know, this is, this is the way it would be. So anyway, he, uh, he was coordinating the walk and everybody loved Dennis. So the, uh, if we talk about this walk needed organized, it didn't need organized because once we launched the idea, it just went bang, 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 and, and, and faithful people all just came in and everything fell into place. And anyway, Dennis and myself and, and uh, four or five is James and the whole group, we were a whole group, we were going down the road to knock, actually preparing the way. And there was groups in Sligo and Bally Shannon and, and Bally Buffet, people from Manish Gillen, there was all, all sorts of things. Anyway, so uh, just before the walk was starting in, in May 1988, uh, that December, Annette had taken ill. I like got prescribed that she need she needed a she needed an organ organ transplant. Now what the organ transplant was. So Dennis came to me in December after after the notification of uh, the medical situation of his wife Annette. He said, "Look, I can't be involved, Thomas." So what happens then is that. Uh, to cut the long story short, uh, Dennis withdraws from from uh, and and that goes off to England for a pioneering operation, which was in Patworth Hospital. Uh, when she returns, she lives for a few months and then she dies, I think, in March. So uh, Dennis is still not going to be involved in the walk. But the group of up and down the road had asked James if he had organised a trip to Majigori with them. So they organised for Easter that year. And then because they loved Dennis so much, they decided to buy him a ticket and took him to Magigori as well. So when he's on the when he when he's when he's on the mountain one night, uh, he's a heavy man, he's thick black hair, though he's elderly, uh, you know, a very strong man. And but he's coming gently down the mountain at night and and the in the, in the dusk. And uh, when he gets to the seven station, praying the stations the cross coming down the mountain, he turns, uh, he feels that Satan's on the mountain behind him. And he says, Thomas, the way he explained to me, he says, Thomas, he says, jet black, thick hair. He says, it's all standing on my head. He says, I just feel it standing on the back of my neck, the fear. As he turns to the face and the uh, face across, he saw Christ come alive from, uh, uh, at the station. And he said it disintegrated on the, it, it was obviously a revelation of the passion, hmm. uh, the Scottish Christ. Uh, and when he goes down the mountain, he goes to the Church of St. James. 
an early Mason American priest were in the confessional area to the side and they have a long conversation. He always has confession and he talks about an death and the family and the, and, 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 and the circumstances. But then he shared with the priest what he, what he had witnessed on the mountain. And they both discerned the key. The key robber does this. They both discerned it. didn't just come from Dennis. It didn't. It wasn't his idea. It wasn't his. They both discerned what the message was. So when he came back to Ireland, he, he again stepped up to coordinate the walk that year. And he spoke in the Crusader community. And he spoke in all the towns along the way in the first year. And what he, what he was given, what, what he said, the walk, the purpose of the walk to knock was a direct call from Our Lady in Christ for prayers to break the chains of those who are shackled by their sons in the world and fear of their sons being discovered are disabled for working for Christ. Right. So uh, that, that is the key. Mm -hmm. So when you start to see 88, the walk doesn't walk in 89, it's a one off in 88. And then in the 1990s, some people that have done the crescendo and others who have done the walk decide we're going to get this going again, namely George Fitzpatrick and Dan Cassidy. And they arrive at my door and says, right, Thomas, we're going to get this going again in 1990. And then the guys start to come from Belfast and it takes a life of its own. What I'm saying to you over the years, I've seen many change broken. Mm -hmm. I've, heard the, the, <clears throat> I've heard the personal testimonies of many men heavily involved in the troubles, all situations in life that actually have come to me up with their change and growth. And, and, and those men who were involved in the troubles, walking the road to knock. Uh, one, one such is on, the, particularly in the Belfast walk, I actually checked out between, and one morning, the men that are, and the women I'd walk with, because women were in Armagh jail and all the men were in long case and that sort of stuff. And I would ask them personally, many, many years in long case or whatever, and I'd, I'd worked out over 100 years on the small group that I'd walked with that morning. So you, you're really talking about substantial stuff when you see people really, really change this, is, you know. And this is the point, this is the prayer. Now, and the theology, the theology of the walk is simple. There's no, there's no, there's no deep depth. It's simple. Knock as the mass. And we pray the rosary on the way to Mass. And we don't pray the rosary on our way to knock. We pray to the rosary every day on the way to the Mass each day. And then we start again again, praying the rosary to the Mass the next day, and so on and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and that and that great mystery and those great mysteries of the rosary, the Holy Spirit reveals everything. Mm -hmm. So and this is about the whole idea of you know, not getting into talking in the morning because the minute you talk, they'll talk all day. But actually getting under the mystery. And that's where you see real life, real life change and real substance coming on the and and the people's lives like and that. And that's been that's that's when it, it comes to that joy of the walk and all the madness and all the strain and all and suddenly in our life here in the north, we have had substantial change. Now, can you say the walk did not brought that? No, that would be a mistake. You think about all the prayer groups and all the groups that have been praying for peace in the north. You see, the point, the point that we all have to realize that actually God leads all the time. So in the response to that prayer, prayer has to be a physical human interaction. So he not only gives it to walk, but he gives it to all those uh, groups that are actually working for peace in the north. But the walk in some way is actually uh, is a uh, is is a key is a key to that, and it's a key to the conversion of of Republicans. Mm -hmm. And they're already saying before the priest process really gets off going, they're already saying something has to change here. Yeah. So God is working on the hearts and the minds, the souls of the people that are there, and 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 West Belfast and Derry and South Armagh, you know, through and Dundalk. All those areas. So, if you, and I explained this in Spain. I explained this in Spain to the crochet community because we're seen to be different how we approach the crochet because of the way we operate, you know, uh, uh, really. And and what when I was explaining to them, I said, look, without crochet, without Eduardo uh, beginning this this uh, receiving this charism from the Holy Spirit. Now, Eduardo, I have to say this actually, it's very important for people to realize Eduardo never claimed to be the founder of crochet. Eduardo 
claim to be an apprentice of the Holy Spirit, mm. <laughs> which is a whole different uh, ballgame. He said, you know, he was always pointing to the Holy Spirit as being the author, as being the founder. And and and, and he was one of the apprentices that actually was, was bringing it through. So, but I explained to them, I said, look, without Eduardo and without Priscilla, without the exoset muscles that had dairy and the exoset muscle that had West Belfast and the exoset muscle that had and the Armada Dundalk, I wonder where we would be today. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I can attest firsthand, you know, the warmth that I, you know, I felt in Derry last year and by organizing a simple adoration where, you know, dozens of people have reached out to me that they got conversion and they got um, peace of being able to confess stuff that they hadn't done for years, you know, you know, not not being known that they're loved by God and uh, and the rec- receptivity of of uh, you know doing something small and practical in in Derry and and it, and it shone through the love for the faith the lay led love for the faith in in, in Derry and and the support um, you know f- from clergy and bishop and bishop donald as well and and i'm just and i was there thinking why can't we just do this in the rest of ireland why can't we show ireland that there is hope like the Christian movement is doing in Derry, like what you've been doing in Thermobacca for years, just show people the practical reality that there is hope and that the, what the faith can give, you know, this personal encounter of Christ can give to your life. And uh, I really think now is, uh, I really think that all of this, all of these events are for our, Ireland today because we have so much money, we have employment, we have our cars, we have our mortgages, our houses, and yet so many people don't have hope. Um, and th- that's borne out by the 500 plus suicides, that uh, male suicides that happen in every uh, every year in Ireland. And that's just the pyramid because below that, you know, we have, you know, a whole, a whole, you know, thousands of people without hope. And it's very, very sad. And I think I think this is all co- we're, we're calling out to, to be um you know th- those that that show that there is hope in Ireland, and it's and it's and, and I really f- do feel that it's the Holy Spirit that's working, that's drawing us together, because this isn't contrived. Nobody planned this. It, it you know, it, it, our, it, 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 this is the Holy Spirit drawing us back to Him and uh, drawing us back to that encounter. Absolutely, and uh, and you know, uh, if for me personally. For me personally, obviously from the graces that I've received from, from the walk and from, from the Christian and Derry, Derry has always been a place of prayer. It's always mm-hmm. been a deprived place. It's still a deprived place today. It's in the, uh, the, the, the northwest corridor here of Northern Ireland is one of the economic black spots of Britain today. Although we're, we're, we're in a British society and a British system, it's one of the economic... And you have to just ask yourself a question. Is that the reason why the faith is so rich? And mm. I'll tell you now, when I go south and I hear people speak, I'm shocked. Absolutely shocked. And one of the reasons why I've been walking from Dublin from 2003 is because we're right in the heart of it. Mm. God wants to take it and actually melt it. You know, um, well, it's an our story. You know part of that story. That'll be an hour day. Uh, you know what the wall city here means and mm. why Derry. Right, we're gonna we're gonna open the door now. But if you're asking me today, why Dublin? Well, I know why Dublin because it's the hardest city in Ireland. Yeah, yeah. Political system, everything has been bought, and therefore the money that's awash in Ireland is buying your soul. Yeah, that's what people need to hear. And and certainly, I would know the reason why I'm going to Dublin is because it's the heart of my country. Yeah, and it has to be exercised out of Ireland and it's only when people start to claim their own city and that's all we're doing in Derry and Belfast we're claiming our own place and we're taking it to the mother see we're, we're, we're taking it why why because because she <laughs> it's the triumph of the Immaculate Heart we have probably and again it's another story for another day self knock itself which does not what I understand is one of the key apparitions in the whole world 
and 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 for Irish people, even just to throw a wee tip it out there, knock a spilt upon the souls that died in Ireland for their faith. The impoverished peasants of Ireland that died because they wouldn't change their faith. The famine story has been has been uh, adjusted and 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 blended on the Irish history as if it's something insignificant. It's bigger than we'll ever understand. And a knock, our heaven came to earth in, in the heavenly mass and showed an apparition, uh, which is actually as a result of the 100 masses of Archdeacon Kavanagh for the souls that he couldn't give an individual mass to in his lifetime. He was given the last rise to between 30 to 50 people a day through his whole ministry from a young curate in Westport right through to the to the year uh, 1879. And, and, and don't forget, it's one of the last years of famine. When he comes to Nauk in 1866, 20 years on, 21 years on from the beginning of the famine, there's still, there's still people living in hovels. Yes. People still don't have homes. You know? Yeah. And then, and you think of all those the souls that migrated from this land, or the souls that actually died on this land, all because of the faith. And here we are now, awash with money, and everybody saying we don't need the faith. Yeah. Right. The faith that's built on your ancestors, our ancestors, we're giving up. Yeah. We're being bought. You're being bought. You know. And this is the point, this is the point, the real reality is this is what the walk is about. This is the walk about actually turning the table around. Who do you worship? Do you worship Satan or do you worship Christ? Yeah. That's the message. That's the big message. Your choice. No prisoners in heaven. Yeah. No. Don't procrastinate. Follow the faith. Follow Jesus. Look to Jesus and everything. Doesn't matter what crisis is on going on in this church. There's only one head of this church, and that's Jesus Christ Himself. And we stay focused on Him. We will stay true to the faith. Once we start to disagree with one another, you've lost sight of Him. Yeah. And uh, and and certainly when you look under the money, uh, can, and I don't know what I, I don't know what problem saying. I've seen Ireland transformed in the 35 years I've been walking. I can see the wealth when I go across the border. I can see the attitudes when I go across the border. So I know in the Republic of Ireland, it's a whole different place than the North. You know, and even yeah. even the good loving Protestants here and that sort of stuff, it's evident in the North. The North doesn't disintegrate under a civil war because of the good loving people on both sides mm. of them that believe in Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, so that's the big message. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not pulling any punches. I say no, no prisoners in heaven. <laughs> yes, no I, prisoners. Jesus is not going to force you to go there. Yeah, you, you have I, to work. Yeah. And I think it's very important that we tie in we tie in this whole interview because uh, we're talking about unity, and um, your daughter Emma has been promoting the unity prayer from Perth. And we obviously have uh, the the documentary, The Road to the Triumphs. So there's a lot that we need to connect in here. But there's one big thing that I, I do want to bring in at the end of this interview, which is Sister Claire Crockett. Uh, when I was did, did some of the interviews last year, some of the some of the talkers there in Termabaca, many people were commenting on the fact that she had done retreats in that Carmelite Center. That's the kind of the, the headquarters now for Curcio retreats in Ireland, practically. And and I just thought maybe you can tie in a little bit this girl from um, from that parish, uh, because, you know, the, the home of the mother is the renewal of the Eucharist, uh, uh, Our Lady, uh, the, 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 the apostle they have for the youth, and, and tie all of this in, because I think that that's all building on all of the work that you've already done. Yeah, well, we uh, as a family here, my brother, had, uh, he was he was asked to go on a golfing trip to um, Spain in nineteen ninety six, and uh, he 
he had second thoughts about going away with the man, so he decided that he would go away with his wife as well. And they decided to look for a pilgrimage. So they'd been uh, they'd been to different lords and Panama and that sort of stuff. So they were looking around at different pilgrimages, Marian pilgrimages and so on. And everywhere they checked, everywhere they went to look for a pilgrimage, actually it was uh, was booked out. Yeah. So they literally couldn't get the lure. So then they noticed one for Garabandal. And they decided, okay, well, we'll, we'll go there. And uh, when they were there, when when, when they were up at the up at the shrine one day, uh, Sean noticed a, a troop of priests and brothers actually coming over a hill right for a walk and uh, and he ended up getting caught in, in a conversation with them. There's a great Mexican man, or well, he's a Spanish, a Spanish descent, uh, Jose Marie, and his bro- his son had actually uh, was a was a brother at that at that, at that stage. So he he was training for the priesthood. So he got to talk to Jose Marie and uh, and Jose Marie likes a wee glass of wine, and Sean likes a glass. So they got on a long conversation. So in other way, it led to a relationship between the home of the mother and Sean. So they were coming there, and a number of the a number of the those training for the for the priest at that time were Irish. Mm-hmm. So they're coming regularly to Ireland, and uh, Sean invited them to come north to Derry. So they came to his house, and then so that from ninety six on was the whole relationship. Uh, with with Derry and and the home of the mother as well as other parts of Ireland, uh, but they, they they loved Derry, and actually it was here actually they were in discussions with Bishop Higgerty way back in the late nineties to actually try and get their first foundation mm. of sisters here in the north would have been the first, uh, so it's taken a long road anyway. That led to, that led to a relationship, so they were always on the show. And you need to bring a group. You need to bring a group. To Spain, and then uh, so Sean was regularly out with them, and they were regularly here. So in the year two thousand, the Holy Week uh, retreat, and it was a lot of English people coming from America and that sort of stuff. So they put the pressure on Sean, severe pressure. It was actually they were here and and Derry, and I remember him saying, "I'm he caved in." He just said, "Okay, I'll organize it." And then oh no, he says he didn't say we'd organize. Okay, we'll do it. And he turned around to me and he says. You can get the people, and I'll get the money. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I've been a member of Chris Hill Then that's when it opened up for Chris Hill and the core group. Uh, so we asked the young people that they want to go, and uh, the obviously the tops were being paid for and that sort of stuff. So there's a small number from the core group went along with it. Claire was not going on that trip. So what happened two weeks? That's the key point. The two weeks before the trip, our best friend Sharon Dorn. Uh, she was uh, she was got appendicitis mm-hmm. and uh, and obviously had a couldn't couldn't come so she was, had an operation and that sort of stuff and needed to recover. So at the same time the ticket was there, so we said to Sharon, if you want to nominate somebody else to take your ticket, and it was clearing up the ticket. Wow. Now the most unsuspected thought she was going on a holiday Spain, thought she was going to the beach. <laughs> Uh, a real, a real character, a real personality. So, I ended up there and nearly died the day they have been on a pilgrimage. So, but what I witnessed everything that happened with her uh, on that particular weekend and in, uh, in the monastery of Cuenca. And to be honest, I would say that actually, if the community, the majority of the community of the, the home of the mother, wouldn't have saw Claire as a, a candidate. Yeah. But the one person that did see uh, her potential was Father Raphael, the founder. You know? yeah. and, and the relationship that they had right from the off was something, something spectacular. Yeah. So she was destined uh, for greater things. Yeah. yeah. You know, so. it's, it's impressive. That, uh, go, ahead. go ahead. You know, it's impressive to listen to the story of, of, of Sister... Um, of Sister Claire Crockett and 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 the and the support that they got from the Crusader movement in 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 her vocation and so forth. Yeah, well, here I, this I think the greatest epitome of Sister Claire Crockett. If Sister Claire Crockett had not gone to the home of the mother, Sister Claire Crockett will be definitely on the Derry Girl show. <laughs> <laughs> she is the epitome of the real Derry girl, the character and everything. Yeah. But and also in saying that it's not been it's actually it really epitomizes the huge, huge trains, you know, uh, when somebody comes to God. 
Yeah. That revelation. And that's literally, if you could actually, you watch Derry Garrett, you watch the antics, and you watch what's going on, that could be, that That would have been Claire Crockett. I have no doubt about that. She would have been a star in that show. Yeah. yeah. But then you look at the change in this, this and, and it's, 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 it's incomparable. Yeah. I guess yeah. I can turn it around now. The other, the other thing I would say, there's one one part of the story that's actually very important to pick out for Claire. It's actually the sense of how God loves us as a soul. Yeah. And that God is, is always working on us. So when actually uh, Father Raphael was actually given a mission, the mission in the church was the defense of the Eucharist, the defense of the honor of our lady, and especially the privilege of purity, or, or the virtue of purity, and, and, the, and the conquest of young people for Jesus Christ. So that's the, that, that, that's the mission. Now, that was confirmed by three different mystics for Father Raphael mm -hmm. before he entered under, under the priesthood, after his experience in Garabandal. Uh, where our lady gave him that mission herself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so one of those mystics is a, a father, Bruno, who lives in the north of Italy. So when Claire came on the retreat, she went back to Spain for Holy Week that, that year. And, and they were making a progression of uh, a, a pilgrimage all the way across Europe to go to Rome for, for the World Youth Day. Yeah. And uh, so what happened was, anyway, they got the opportunity to stop with Father Bruno. And Claire had a, a private time with him. Well, saying private, he speaks only Italian. She said, so there was translators there as such. So at, 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 the, at the meeting, Claire was obviously discerning at that stage, you know, starting to switch from the, the dairy girl and starting to think, could I, could I be a, a, one of these sisters? Could I be, could I do this? And, and, and that's exactly what she tried to express to him uh, she tried it. She was. She, that's the question she was going to ask. But he said, "Stop." Right, and and he said to her, uh, "If you already have been asked, yes, you can. If you're already called, no, we're sure, yes, you can." And then he says, "I advise you to fly to God the way you used to fly on the field of daisies when you were a child." So where Claire lives, she lives on the island of Derry and her house, the bank and leading up to the to St. Collins College and further on to the Wall City. And that bank is and, and all that area is known as the Daisy Field. So as a child, she used to go up and down that bank and flying down like this. Yeah. So there and to me that epitomized that God God was after her, right? Right from child. Yeah. God was beside her. Right from church, waiting for that door to open. So when you talk about uh, uh, the formation of Claire, part of that formation is as a young teenager coming to do the car weekend. Yeah, and it's the first time. And you know, and, and she does mention it in her writings from time again how, you, and in a simple way that helped her to prepare. And it certainly was a way of her expressing her character as well. And it's also the stepping stone that led her to, let her yeah. to and let her to. What she was destined to be you know she wanted to be a great movie star and i remember her saying that she wanted to be i will be a great actress and that sort of stuff uh on that whole weekend and actually i will be a famous you know actress <laughs> and then they were saying but possibly you could be an nun and she said okay i'll be a famous nun and yeah. that's exactly what she became now also on that weekend uh it's interesting that actually before that weekend they didn't have any cameras or whatever uh it was that year, just a few months before or whatever, they were donated a whole suite of cameras. Yeah. Right. And 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 then began to practice by actually filming things. So that's why they caught that testimony. That's why they caught all that. And that's why when Claire comes along, God had provided all the means to capture the whole story of her life. So actually, when you look at the documentary, it's not a documentary where somebody's actually taken her role. It's herself. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and there, for the first time, you can see the transition of a soul, yeah, right, to this, yeah. to the very, very, very special person. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to bring in another woman now linked to Derry, linked to the Walk to Knock, in a very special way, um, and uh, I, uh, her name is Geraldine McCarrion, and her brother was walking the Walk to Knock. 
And uh, that woman was looking to be, she'd gone with the Sisters of Charity in, um, you know, Mother Teresa's and she, and she couldn't, uh, she had uh, some health problems. She came back to Ireland and um, she actually joined the Sisters, the Petrol Sisters of Adoration, the same congregation that Martina Purdy and Elaine Kelly were in. She joined them in Wexford. And their first night at that convent, she suffered a, uh, a, an asthmatic attack and sadly died on her first night, uh, giving her, herself to God in, in that convent. And this is all linking in this woman as well, her, her love for the Eucharist. Um, it's all linking into Darian. And I think there's more stories that will come out that will show God's hand in, in what you've been doing and in Derry. And, and I, and I'm, and I'm, and I'll try and detail it out in, in future videos, but it, it goes to show God isn't absent in Ireland and his hand is definitely there and working if we just allow him. Well, look, uh, if if I was to share some of the stories, we'd be yeah. here for me. I know, I know. <laughs> and, and some of them, you know, and yeah. you know, and, and you know, you you've met some of the characters on the walk. This is this is real. This is not. Uh, no, no, it's not. This, this it's is. He, he's definitely he's definitely around. Yeah, definitely around, and he's got his hand on some people, you know. Yeah, and and really, it's that call. It's that call to faith. That's that call. The same call to Patrick. You know, yeah, they come is. to the they come to this pagan land yeah. and preach the gospel, and that's what we're being called to do today. Good. Um, I think we we'll, we'll need to wrap it up here because I know you've you've got time a time a timetable to meet today. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Robert. But, thank you. Thank right. you very much, and uh, we'll let let it be the start of many good conversations in Ireland. Okay, Robert. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. God, God bless. bless.